Welcome to everybody. My name is Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. We have a splendid group today and a wonderful conversation that I'll introduce in just a moment. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that for all of us, this has been a very hard week as we watch what happens and unfolds in Afghanistan. And whatever one's policy preferences are, our hearts go out and our prayers to the journalists there and the civilian, and the civilian population there trying to stay safe and in some cases trying to exit the country. We're doing some work in that area, we'll continue to do so, but I thought I should mention that and then tell you that today we turn or return to a subject which is really core to American purpose and really central to why we started this last fall. And that is the future, the health and the defense of liberalism. We have as our moderator today, Bill Galston, who is a found, founding member, editorial board member, scholar at the Brookings Institution, a regular weekly columnist for the Wall Street Journal. So thank you, Bill, for being available. I know you're traveling and it's the middle of August, but it's great to see you. And then our guest of honor, Professor Timothy Garton Ash from Oxford. He needs no introduction, but I think it's required to, to say that he is a distinguished historian, essayist, someone from whom I've learned much about European politics, and by the way, German politics, and by the way, East Germany back in the day, um, over the years. And so Professor Garten Ash, Timothy, welcome to you, and it's great to see you. And then I just want to say, we will focus, at least initially, I believe, Bill, on a splendid essay that you wrote, Timothy, some months ago, about a half a year ago for Prospect Magazine on the future of liberalism. To format everybody, the first half, there'll be a conversation Bill will manage with Professor Garden Ash, the second half roughly Q&A, and we'll get everybody, respect for your time, our guests of honor, done in one hour sharp, or to be specific, 11.30, Eastern. But with that, welcome to everybody. Welcome, Timothy Garten Ash and Bill Galston. Welcome. You have the floor. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome Timothy Garten Ash uh, to our forum. As Jeff says, his topic is at the heart of the animating purpose and concerns of American Purpose, the magazine, and of the many, many people. Uh, who have gathered around it in just the past few months. Uh, 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 Timothy and I will spend the next 25 minutes in a colloquy, uh, 25 minutes after that for Q&A, and then he and I will wrap it up with an exit question starting at about 11.25 Eastern time. Uh, when I read this essay, I was astounded to discover uh, that I agreed with every word of it. That doesn't happen very often. I asked myself why, uh, and I dug a little and found the answer. Uh, you know, we are both Berliners. Uh, you know, not donuts stuffed with jelly, uh, but uh, uh, in fact, disciples of Isaiah Berlin. Uh, decisively influenced by him. Uh, Timothy Revere's Pierre Hasner. It was Pierre Hasner's essay on Kant that inspired me to write my first book. Uh, you know, Ralph Doren Derendorf, uh, another fundamental building block of Timothy's outlook. And by chance, I've been invited to give the Ralph Darendorf Memorial Lecture at a transatlantic conference in Portugal this fall. I could go on. Uh, it's almost as though we were separated at birth. Uh, and so let me begin with a broad question and then 
will be able to dribble, uh, drill down, I believe, after, you, after you've responded to it. Uh, you look at the past 30 years, they can be divided almost equally into 15 years of liberal democratic advance after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism, followed by 15 years of liberal democratic retreat with illiberal forces on the offensive, uh, stunning people who thought that liberal democracy was the inexorable wave of the future. So my broad opening question, what in your judgment has gone wrong with liberal democracy uh, to stifle its advance and what can be done to put it right? Well, thank you, Bill. And let me say, start by saying it's a great pleasure to be with this group. I see many names of good friends and people whose work I admired. And of course, the theme of this essay is the subject we've all been wrestling with for the last few years. I looked at the mission statement, statement of American purpose, and it seemed to me it could also be called Western purpose or European purpose or dare I say universal purpose. I don't, don't think it's a specifically American purpose. And by the way, to start the conversation, we have to note the peculiar fact that the meaning of the word liberal undergoes this weird metamorphosis when one enters American airspace, when it suddenly comes to mean something like a combination of socialism and fornication. Um, and, and, and I think it's really part of our shared purpose must be to restore what you call classical liberal, the, the meanings of liberal that come from the great experimental history of the last 400 years shared between us across the Atlantic, to restore that more into American discourse. Um, now, in answer to your great question, that's of course the, the starting point and, and your periodization seems to me exactly right. I'm writing a history of contemporary Europe at the moment and you have what I call the post-wall period, roughly 1989 to 2004, five, which is an extraordinary period of the advance of liberal democracy culminating in a way in the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, if one wants to pin it on one event, 2004-05. And since that time, we've had this extraordinary erosion and retreat of liberal democracy, not just in those borderline cases where it was always fragile, not just in countries like Poland and Hungary, but even coming under attack in the heartlands of liberal democracy, uh, like Britain and the United States. And it seems to me there are three dimensions to this, and I call it the three prongs of Neptune's um, um, of, 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 of Neptune's tripod. First, it's the defense of the classical institutions and values of liberal democracy, freedom of speech, free press, rule of law, um, separation of powers, and so on which we've perhaps been taken too much for granted in our own countries. Secondly, it is what we've all seen, which is the mistakes made in the name of liberalism, roughly speaking over the last 30 to 40 years. And since you mentioned Isaiah Berlin Bill, I mean, two key mistakes. Number one, that liberalism became reduced to a closed ideological system, rather than being what I call liberalism as method, an experimental method, a method always open to trial and error and self-correction. Um, and secondly, of course, hubris, our old Greek friend hubris, that we simply became overconfident. Um, and uh, we could perhaps go into more depth into what the particular failings of liberalism were and how we might address them, I summarize them in a great formula from an essay of Pierre Asner, the lack of the neglect of solidarity and equality on the one hand and community and identity on the other. And then the third aspect is of course, that the authoritarians got smart. We learned from them, then they learned from us. Quite systematically, the Chinese communist Party, Vladimir Putin and others learned how to beat us at our own goal, at our own game. And that's what we're responding to. Well, 
that really sets, sets the stage for all of the questions that I have for you, uh, all of which are drawn almost verbatim from your essay. So, you know, you have a decidedly Blairish formulation early on, you know, where you say we must be tough on populism and tough on the causes of populism. I wonder if you'd unpack that for us, please. Absolutely. So I think there is a, a kind of liberal discourse that it, it, it kind of implies that the problem is all them. Um, Hillary Clinton's The Basket of Deplorables is perhaps a classic example, but we had a lot of that in the Brexit debate. And of course, there are a lot of problems with them, with those political entrepreneurs who are called populists. But we have as much to look at what we got wrong and whence their successful popular appeal came, be it in Hungary or Poland or Britain or the United States. Um, and that's the tough on the causes of populism. And as I started saying, I think if you think of the two Hasnerian steps, solidarity and equality and community and identity. So just to, to indicate a few points which will be familiar to most of you, but, but it's worth starting with them. Clearly we allowed soaring levels of inequality, not just economic inequality. One of the main points I want to make is that the inequality that has emerged in the name of what was mistakenly called liberalism, one-dimensional liberalism, was as much the inequality of attention and respect as it was inequality of income or wealth. Classic example, East Germany. Four out of five voters for the IFD, the Alternative für Deutschland, assess their own personal economic situation as good or very good. And yet they're furious. It was about the inequality of attention and respect. True of the Brexit vote, uh, you tell me, but I think true of many people in the Rust Belt. So it is as much about uh, addressing the inequality of attention and respect. That is to say a kind of solidarity as it is about the equally important, but much more obviously discussed addressing economic inequality. You remember Ronnie Dworkin, his key formulation on the nature of a, a, of a liberal society was uh, one that showed equal respect and concern to each of its citizens. And we fell far short on equal con concern and respect. Um, community and identity, just very quickly, um, Certainly in Europe, uh, I don't know whether it's as true of the United States, but certainly in Europe, it wasn't so much that we were had a sort of hypertrophied individualism. Of course, in some sense, that was true of globalized financialized capitalism, but it wasn't so much that. It was that we were highly selective in the communities and identities that we chose to talk about. So we liberals, cosmopolitan liberals, particularly in Europe, talked a huge amount about the international community and a great deal about subnational communities, minority communities, multiculturalism and all that. But we didn't talk about the national community. And effectively, we left talking about the nation to the right, to the nationalist right. And so one of my key theses is that we have to reclaim the national community, reclaim a liberal patriotism, but in an open, civic, inclusive way. Uh, fabulous. That gives rise to two follow-up questions, uh, one of which will be annoyingly materialistic and the other of which much less so. Uh, you know, what you said about soaring inequality, of course, touches a responsive chord uh, for American listeners. And certainly the center left and the progressive left are grappling with that question in very practical terms right now. What is your formula for muting, not eliminating, but muting uh, this inequality and its socio-political consequences consistent with the liberal tradition as you understand it. How, we, how should we think about that? 
So I, that's a great question, Bill. And of course, it, it goes to the evolution of liberalism, with which you're very familiar, from, as it were, classical, classical liberal liberalism to, to modern egalitarian liberalism. So my dear friend Ralph Darnoff talked about the need for a common flaw from which everyone could rise according to their own ability and industry uh, and so on. And that common floor consisted not just in housing and healthcare, but crucially in education. And he actually argued fascinatingly way back 30 years ago for a basic income. And so I would certainly argue for the common floor. Now, theoretically, you could argue that one could achieve the common floor with massive inequality at the top. What does it matter so long as everyone has enough to have an equal start in life if some people at the top have much too much? But in practice, that simply doesn't work. Number one, because you've got to find the money for laying the common floor and you're not gonna find that money without a wealth tax, a land tax, some elements of taxing the super rich who by the way, in personal consumption won't notice the difference. But secondly, because uh, what happens is that with such inequalities of wealth, that perpetuates other inequalities. The economist had a wonderful phrase. They talked about the hereditary meritocracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what, when one looks at the top year American universities like Stanford, where I spend part of each year, you sort of see the hereditary meritocracy. One study suggested the top American universities give more places to people from the top 1% by household income as for the entire bottom 60%. So that's the second point. The third point, crucially, is that such inequalities, such extreme financial and economic inequalities uh, become major inequalities of power and an absolutely fundamental constant of all liberalism worthy of the name is that it's about limiting and controlling power. And in many of our societies, particularly Britain and the United States, we have something very close to a sort of corporate plutocratic oligarchy, um, which has, has, a, has, has in a large degree had a kind of capture of the state. Now let me turn, uh, you, that is, so to speak, the first prong of Dworkin's formula, equality of concern and respect. Uh, now let's turn to the other one, respect. Uh, as readers of this journal know, you know, I completely agree with your position on inequality of respect uh, and the need for you know, what you quote the Polish populace is saying, namely, you know, is calling for, namely, a redistribution of respect. Uh, let me ask you this question, you know, from a very American perspective. Uh, I want to give equal respect to all individuals and groups in American society. But I have to say, speaking frankly, that the people who are resisting vaccinations, for example, are making it very hard for me, right? Uh, you know, it's very hard to draw Kant's line between the person qua person and the person qua, you know, bearer of character, bearer of opinions and beliefs, et cetera. Uh, and I'd be surprised if something similar isn't going on in the UK and every place else. So, how in practice do we grapple with this question of restoring some sort of parity of respect? So it's a great question and you will know very well the, I think, very powerful distinction between recognition respect and appraisal respect. Mm -hmm. Recognition respect being, you touched on it, the recognition I owe to every human being by virtue of their human personhood. Appraisal respect being, hey, you've just written a great book or, or scored five goals, and that's amazing, or you're Roger Federer. Uh, and and um, I, I think that's an important uh, distinction to hang on to. That is to say, just to take a very concrete example, if you look at the journalism about the Rust Belt 
or the Appalachians or the north of England, um, which came after the populist wave when metropolitan journalists piled into taxis and went on safari in their own countries. Um, it, 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 it lacked that recognition respect. It, 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 it lacked that imaginative sympathy, which is such an important liberal quality, which I find in the work of Charles Dickens or George Eliot, that I can imagine what it's like to be you, even if I think you're talking complete and dangerous nonsense. Um, not to mention the fact that the journalists had never been there for 20 years before that. So that's a kind of concrete example. And I actually think media coverage is really important to this. The second point is, and you touched on the situation in the US at the moment, uh, which is very painful to me. Um, liberalism, of course, posits a shared public sphere. It posits a shared ground of facts, a kind of shared epistemic space. And what I see in the United States and, and uh, is the disappearance of that shared public sphere, the disappearance of that shared flow of facts, the sh disappearance of that shared epistemic space. And that is extremely worrying. I see the same thing happening in Poland. By the way, interestingly, it has not happened in Britain. Do you remember a couple of years ago, everyone was saying Britain is going to be divided like the United States? There will be two tribes, leavers and remainers for 50 years to come. Not a bit of it. Why? Because we still have a shared public sphere. Why? Well, amongst other things, because we still have the BBC. So I think that area is also extremely important for, for the reform and revival of, of liberalism. Excellent. Uh, I have just two other areas I want to touch on in the next six minutes, uh, and then I'll yield the floor to Jeff to, to manage the flow, flow of questions. Uh, the, the first is this, going back to your point about the liberal respect, neglect of national community as opposed to supranational and subnational. I couldn't agree more. As an American, of course, it's easy for me to agree you know, with the idea of civic patriotism, a little bit harder uh, in Germany, perhaps, a uh, little, little bit easier in France, perhaps, uh, because of their, their peculiar Republican, Republican history. But at the same time that you call, you call for what I'll, what I'll term a new liberal nationalism, you also call for a new liberal localism. And in the United States, we've struggled with that. What needs to be uniform and what can be diverse? Uh, if, you, if you transfer national power to localities, the right to decide, uh, you will get not only diversity, but in many cases, inequality, starting with the question of voting rights. So how do you put the new nationalism and the new localism together? Well, first of all, I don't think, I think the founding fathers would have agreed that there's no contradiction in principle between those two things, those different levels of self-government. It's getting the right things done at the right levels, isn't it? So clearly it is ridiculous that voting procedures should still be the subject for 10,000 different jurisdictions, uh, if I, uh, as I understand it in the United States, the specific procedures for voting. Um, on the other hand, you know, I'm talking to you from Oxford, from a country which is one of the most over-centralized countries in the world. And having a vastly over-centralized country where, uh, all the key decisions are taking at the center in Whitehall is extremely damaging to the sense of civic participation and citizenship because it's all being done over there. And it helps to exchange not only why, explain not only why you have Scottish nationalism and Welsh nationalism, but also problems of integration because, and I'm sure you've talked about this a lot, of course, for all our societies, one of the key questions is those of the integration of immigrants. Uh, and how immigrants on whom Europe's entire future depends, certainly Western Europe's entire future depends, uh, can become part of the, 
of, of a liberal we. And if you look at that process of integration, Bill, in Europe, it happens to a very large degree locally, in towns, in cities, and through that to the national level. So I think both are important, and I think it's just a matter of getting right what is done at which level. Well, as always, uh, in your country and ours and everywhere, the devil is in the details. Uh, here is my final, my final question for you in this segment. Uh, in your essay, you make a point that goes all the way back to Aristotle about the pace of change and the ability of most people to adjust uh, to a rapid pace of change. Uh, you, you quote uh, Karl Marx's famous line from the Communist Manifesto, all that is solid melts into air, you know, an experience that has been repeated over and over again in the past two centuries. Uh, and so here is my question. How, how do you regulate the pace of change? How do you tell people who believe that they have been the victims of injustice for decades or even centuries to slow down? Yeah. Uh, can I make the question even more difficult before trying to answer it? Because you were probably thinking of people in our own societies who are making that case. But equally, we have whole countries, China, India, others, who are making the same case to us when it comes, for example, to climate change, which is a major challenge for liberalism, as I also argue, which is you've enjoyed the benefits of carbon for the last 200 years, you Brits for 250 years, and now you're telling us to take the pain. So it's a very good um, point. Um, I'm going to throw at you a wonderful uh, bit of German, which comes from the former um, German president Joachim Gauck. You will only do this in German. Ziel warende Entschleunigung, which means deceleration while keeping the direction of travel, keeping the goal. And that's, it seems to me, the trick we have to do. We have to keep the direction of travel, the liberal direction of travel, while adjusting the pace to one which people will not rebel against because as Mary Shelley said, the human mind cannot take too much change. And there, um, people talk, in my view, far too much about neoliberalism. I, I don't think it was the ideology that was a problem. I think it was the reality of globalized, financialized capitalism. Both words being equally important, globalized and financialized. Uh, which produced that unacceptable rate of change and that sense of, uh, of, of everything changing at once irresistibly, like a revolution. So I think uh, a very conscious reassertion of control by the democratic state, including, by the way, over its own borders, you know, take back control was not accidentally the successful slogan of the Brexiteers, is, is a key aspect of answering your question. Uh, if people feel that the democratic state is still fundamentally in control and managing things, then I think they can accept a, a kind and rate of change that they might not otherwise accept if they felt it was out of control, as the Brexit voters did. Thanks so much. As I pass the baton to Jeff, I note that I've focused entirely on the internal challenges to liberal democracy that uh, Timothy Garton Ash has discussed in his essay. But as he notes and discusses, there are also external challenges, uh, notably but not exclusively from the people, People's Republic of China. And he may want to address that dimension of his argument during the questions and answers. So Bill, thank you. And gentlemen, thank you very much. This first portion was stimulating and clear and precise. And we're eager to get going with Q&A. I will mention that 
Timothy Garden Ash's essay and prospect, the piece we've been discussing is thanks to my colleague Michelle High in chat now. If you haven't read it, please read it. Uh, Bill, you have written about these subjects, plural, in different places, but including in American Purpose. And Michelle, when you have a chance, you might put into chat Bill's essay for us titled The Bitter Heartland. We're going to take Q&A for about 20 minutes. I will give it back to you, Bill, five minutes before the hour is up. So 1125 Eastern will close at 1130 Eastern sharp. The floor is open. If I fail to see you, I'm looking for hands raised, chat function, buttons pushed. If I neglect seeing you, Michelle, please jump in and tell me what I'm missing or whom I'm missing. But Dan Zellickson, I think you were in not just with a comment in chat, but a question. Are you there and are you available to ask? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, Dan, Dan, I know who you are and many do, but perhaps not all. Would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yeah, I'm a physicist in Palo Alto and uh, I've written one book review for The American Purpose and I hope to write more in the future. Um, so I wrote a question, which I'll just read. I said, Agreed, inequality manufactures discontent. But in an immense economy, ours, um, innovation on a scale commensurate with that economy requires capital on a scale commensurate with that economy. So if only this, so if, if we desire to reduce inequality, we're reducing the amount of capital in the hands of the wealthiest. So if only the state has access to the capital or has such capital required to produce the innovation that we want, we don't even know what we need, but what we want, um, then we rely on the state as the source of innovation. But I think history says that's not a good idea. So it seems to me there has to be a balance, but I don't know where the balance is. And I'm just wondering what you, in your careful consideration, have thought about this problem, if you have. So Thank certainly, you. I don't want <laughs> distribution of capital to be in the hands solely or even mainly of the state. But here's the thing. Uh, um, in a sense, capital has always been the Achilles heel of capitalism. That is to say, financial services. Uh, it is no accident that the history of capitalism is punctuated by crises in banks, on stock exchanges, in financial services. Because the question of how you generate that capital and get it to the right places for a productive economy is a key question, as you rightly said. And clearly, this is one of the very big things that went wrong in what was called liberalism in the years up to 2008, 2009, to the financial sector crash. Clearly that was not a rational and effective distribution of capital because in fact, there was massive rent seeking done from financial services. So it's not just about income inequality, it's also about the irrationality of that mechanism of distributing capital. Um, a great economist once made the distinction between people who make money by making things and people who make money by taking things. And there was rather too much taking things rather than making things. So the answer to your question lies in the reform of the essentially financial services sector to ensure that we don't get that absurd hypertrophied rent seeking, the privatization of profit and the socialization of loss. And I don't think we've got far enough in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Dan. Uh, could I call on our young associate, Hal, who joins us frequently and contributes beautifully. Hal, you have the floor and tell us who you are. My name is Hal and uh, yeah, no, I currently work as a journalist for a local newspaper, but I'll be going over to the UK as a grad student soon. 
My question is about whether you think that if political gridlock and kind of the removal of uh, some decision-making power from national governments, especially the level has really led to a distrust of democracy or liberalism among young people. I mean, I'm looking to the Congress right now and it's like, do we need to wait for 70 senators or however many senators to approve any sort of climate change or any sort of action on that at all? in order to get the most basic measures passed through, because it seems like more and more any power at all kind of has to be or is being exercised at the level of the ECB or the Fed or any of these basically autopilot institutions as opposed to the legislatures, because those aren't either aren't working or in the case of the EU, were kind of restricted from working as a result of uh, various rules about government finances and things like that. Hey, Hal, so, before, before Professor Gartnash uh, replies, you said you work for a local newspaper. Tell us where you are. I'm in uh, Lebanon, Pennsylvania, the Lebanon Daily News, which is a USA Today network uh, affiliate. Thank you. You could tell us a thing or two about populism and redistribution of respect, I should think. We should listen to you. Listen, a great question. There are two different elements in your question, I think. One is, one is uh, the 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 sense of dissatisfaction with uh, uh, the way democracy is 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 is, is working, um, um, and the other is the sense that um, uh, the, the the real decisions are taken else, elsewhere by the corporations or the banks or whoever it might be. Um, uh, now, or indeed the EU, which is one of the Eurosceptics' great arguments against the EU. Let me tell you an interesting figure. We have just done a big project out of Oxford uh, doing uh, opinion surveys across the EU and the UK. And we asked the question, do you agree with the statement that um, uh, authoritarian states are better equipped than democracies to tackle the climate crisis? 53% of young Europeans agreed that authoritarian regimes are better equipped than democracies. That's a, a shocking figure, 53%, more than half. And then we explored that. We went and started talking to them about it. And it turned out that what they were saying was close to what you were saying, Hal. It's not like the 1920s and 1930s where people went to the Soviet Union and said, I've seen the future and it works. Very few people go to Xi Jinping's China and say, I've seen the future and it works. Uh, nor to Putin's Russia. They're not fascinated by the achievement of authoritarians, but they feel that democracies are incapable of making sufficiently rapid and radical change to address the big challenges of the 21st century above all climate change. And so I think that is an important challenge. Um, you have it in spades with congressional gridlock, a particular problem of your system. Actually, we have that less in Britain. We have quite effective government. Um, it's just the people in charge are not much good, but we have quite effective government. Um, Germany, which is, of course, the central power of Europe, has its own version of that problem, which is changed through consensus. You always have coalition governments. You always have to have coalition agreements. And so I think there's a real challenge to democracies, which is about the, the, the ability to make rapid fundamental reform. I'll thank you for the question. Let me call on our friend and colleague, Daniel Steed from the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, Daniel, before I offer you the floor, if you wouldn't mind, would you also say something about the newsletter that you write and publish, not the Hewlett Foundation, but you, yours, and if you would, how does one sign up for it? You have the floor. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, uh, and uh, I, uh, as Jeff mentioned, I direct the US Democracy Program at the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to be supporting uh, American Purpose and to be in your, your nascent institutions corner precisely because of conversations like this. I, I, in my personal capacity, I have a blog called The Art of Association, which looks at the interplay between civil society and and uh, democracy in the United States. And uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll drop a link in there. You can subscribe. You can also email me if you'd like to receive future posts. So thank you for that uh, plug, Jeff. Um, uh, 
Timothy, thank you for this, both the really stimulating, embracing uh, uh, essay, and then also the, the remarks today. My question really is a, a nice follow-up to Howells and your response to him, and it involves the uh, to what extent uh, the, 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 the political institutions of the democratic legislatures at the national level need to be rehabilitated for this more uh, muscular liberalism that you are describing to come to fruition. I mean, it, you know, the demise of, of, of liberalism as you trace it um, uh, is also a demise. And uh, I think not only in the US but in, in some of our sister democracies in Europe of the role of the legislature vis-a-vis -vis the executive and vis-a-vis -vis the elite institutions the outside of the political process that Hal mentioned. So. Um, uh, so I just, my, I guess my the two part question, one is, uh, do you see the need to revitalize the role of national legislatures in, in re -re revitalizing liberalism? And if so, any thoughts or ideas about how that could occur? So, of course, I do think that's very important. And by the way, it, it's very striking in the European context that what the populists have often said is we stand for democracy against liberalism. Liberalism is Brussels dictating to Greece what their economic policy should be and indeed who their prime minister should be or indeed to Italy. Liberalism is international organizations and corporations and big financial institutions telling governments what to do. And we the populists stand for true national democracy. So it's very much part of the, 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 the ideological challenge from populism. Uh, and therefore demonstrating that this is not in fact the case, that we do have functioning democratic legislatures is very important. And to do that, I think you need to do three or four things. First of all, make sure that politics is not just about parties and the leading candidate, right? The kind of politics we have where it's entirely spin doctor, discipline, everyone, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, spouting the same mes message on message. There's, there's a way of doing politics, um, which is problematic. Um, secondly, politicians might occasionally try to look like real people. Uh, because that was actually, I mean, Joe Biden, in, the, in this respect, a great exception. Um, but all too often, if you look at sort of new labor in Britain, for example, uh, they were so metropolitan in their style um, that it was easy for someone like Nigel Farage to, to, to score off them as, as a common bloke. And indeed, sociologically, many of our parliaments are highly unrepresentative. For example, almost everyone's gone to university. That leaves out socially half the, half the society. So that's point number two. Point number three, uh, I said this before, but I'll say it again. I really do think, again, that um, money and moneyed interest play far too large a role in our politics, in influencing our politics. People feel that, and they are not wrong. I've forgotten who it was whose golden rule of American politics was gold rules. And there's too much truth in that, I think. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I, I see in chat, this is the part I always get wrong. I see in chat our, our colleague, Frank Janacek. And if I may ask you, are you putting comments in chat for us to read or would you like the floor right now? Frank, I don't hear from you. We can return to you. I think Raphael, uh, you actually have a hand up. I'm gonna call on you and if you, welcome. And if you would introduce yourself, please. Many thanks. Um, I'm a diplomat with the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, involved in uh, multilateral affairs in general. And uh, I would like to ask a question about uh, the answer. Um, we should try to, to, to provide. Um, there are a lot of talks about uh, deliberative uh, democracy at the moment, um, at the local, from the local to the international level. There are a few uh, initiatives, 
which are uh, being um, prepared on uh, climate and genomics uh, to try to, uh, to, to bring a kind of complement uh, to uh, the political procedures with, which uh, exist. And I would like to have uh, um, Professors um, Gert and Ash uh, opinion on uh, how he sees these uh, procedures of uh, deliberative democracy. Um, of course, your president, Emmanuel Macron, is a great example in this respect because he had an extraordinary exercise in uh, deliberative democracy going around the country listening to thousands of people giving their opinions, which I, I have to say in all seriousness, I found very impressive. Yes, I think it has an important place to play. Um, it, 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 it's most effective. I think at the local city level, I think it becomes just practically in all sorts of respects, more difficult to organize at national, let alone supranational, for example, European level. So as you know, we have something called the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is, which is aspiring to have a great exercise of deliberative democracy, but how you actually do that is very, very difficult. I mean, even without COVID, how you actually do it. So I think it has an important point to place to, role to pay. But at the same time, I do not think that, that everything that one might call procedural legitimacy is the key at the moment. I actually think the Nike slogan, just do it. I think it's actually delivery, be it for Europe or for national democracies. And so I think delivering the goods is ultimately even more important than desirable elements of deliberative democracy. So thank you. And uh, if I may to Raphael and, and all of you, I hope I'm not too inelegant by addressing you by first name. It's meant in collegiality and not in disrespect. And thank you for bearing with me. So I have now Michael Tolhorst. And Michael, if you would kindly introduce yourself, you have the floor. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Michael Tolhurst. I'm at the Institute for Humane Studies, where we work with academics uh, in the classical liberal tradition. So this conversation is very relevant to my interests. Um, I wanted to follow up on the thread uh, on respect, because this has been a puzzle that I've been wrestling with. And it may have something to do with the, the distinction between kind of recognition respect and appraisal respect. So it seems to me that liberalism can be very good at growing economic pies uh, for, for folks to have greater material prosperity. But it doesn't always seem as good at growing respect pies. And it, is that because respect is like an order, like a rank order good? Or is it that we only have so much attention bandwidth? Is it something that there's winner take all effects in uh, you know, industries like media or academia where you know someone like a Beyonce or a Taylor Swift is gonna sort of create, take so much more attention than all the live artists in the small towns uh, across the country. But this seems to be a tricky problem that I've been uh, trying to figure out, you know, how do we get past that? It's a terrific question. And I, I love the image of the respect pie. So here's, uh, I'm sure you've touched on some elements. Here, here's one element that seems to me particularly relevant. Liberalism by its very nature privileges uh, 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 education, learning, expertise, merit, however understood, cognitive skill. And uh, so it tends to privilege the educated. And we have all of us these 50-50 societies now where roughly half our societies have some higher education and half don't. And, and so, the what, what, what Patrick Deneen polemically but quite usefully calls liberalocracy is about the rule of the educated, the rule of those who've been to, 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 to university. And there's a very interesting book, I, you might be, like to look at it, by an Indian scholar called Rudrangshu Mukherjee, who was at Ashoka University, I don't know if you know it, about the crisis of liberalism. And he says at some point, well, hey, look, the logic of imperialism I mean, colonialism, I mean, the British Empire in India 
was in a way a liberal logic. It was the logic of the educated and enlightened elite telling the unenlightened masses what is good for them. So it's, it's quite a fundamental challenge to, to liberalism, I think, and finding forms of respect for those who don't have the same cognitive uh, or educational achievement level, um, I think is very significant. It connects to the point about the sociology of parliament. If all your representatives have all been to university and all live in big cities, you're not doing very well. Um, one just footnote to this, one country which has done much better on this is of course Germany because Germany has this great tradition of technical and craft education and apprenticeships, which genuinely enjoy high prestige. So a certain redistribution of professional prestige would I think be some contribution to that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michael and Timothy for that exchange. Uh, Bill, it's about to turn to 1124 Eastern. How about that? And if I may, I'd like to pass the microphone back to you for your own final thoughts. And you have an exit question for our guest of honor. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, not by me. Uh, uh, I, actually, I actually have two exit questions and no thoughts of my own. Uh, I have many thoughts of my own, but that, this is not the time or the place for them. Exit question number one. We've talked about the threats from what might be called populist conservatism to liberal democracy. Uh, but at least in the United States, and perhaps not only in the United States, there is a threat to a core liberal value about which you've spoken, namely free speech, that originates from a very different place in the political spectrum. Uh, and what is your take on how liberals should deal with the problem of speech suppression in the name of equality? Absolutely right, in the name of equality and safety. And by the way, of respect, which complicates the story further. There is without question uh, a, an illiberal liberalism a liberalism which says there should be freedom of speech only for liberals as we define them, those people we agree with, which is of course the opposite of a true liberalism. Um, and we have it in our universities as you have it in yours. I myself have had to deal with cases of no platforming of speakers who, you know, one group of students wanted to hear, but another group of students said, you can't hear them because, because, because we don't want you to. And to answer your, your very good question, which is how we should deal with it beyond describing the problem and kind of deploring it, which is a lot of what slightly older liberals do. They spend a lot of time deploring young people these days. Um, I think we have to learn from the way people responded to 1968. If you remember, Bill, there was a whole generation of older liberal professors, including Raymond Aron, who were faced with this challenge of a fairly extreme left-wing ideology coming from protesting students in the class of 68. And there were two reactions to it. One was to become an outright reactionary in response, just to re reject it all. The other was the response of Raymond Aron, which I myself am hoping to, to practice, which is to sit down and talk and really to listen and to understand what these people are saying, what our students are saying particularly, and what in it we can actually learn from and accept, right? And what we have to say, no, sorry, that, that violates an essential of liberalism. So that's, I think, how we best respond to it. Quick example from Oxford. As you know, there's been a great campaign here, Rhodes Must Fall. We have a statue of Cecil Rhodes on Oriel College, right? All my students were out there protesting. I think it's a great campaign. I think Rhodes must fall. Um, I think it would be a brilliant gesture for Oxford to, 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 to make that recognition of its imperial past. Now this 
has been denounced in the same breath as real intolerance, no platforming of speakers and so on. That's a great mistake. So I think we have to learn from Raymond Daron and how he responded to the class of 68. Perfect. And my last question, uh, the late lamented sociologist Daniel Bell once described himself, you know, as me if memory serves, as a liberal in politics, a socialist in economics, and a conservative in culture. Uh, in the same vein, how would you describe yourself within that triad? So actually, I do touch upon this in the essays, you may know, because Leszek Kolakowski, Kolakowski, the great Polish philosopher, wrote an essay and encounter many years ago called How to Be a Conservative Liberal Socialist, arguing that there are key propositions of conservatism, liberalism, and socialism, which seem to him compatible. And I would actually describe myself as a socialist, conservative, liberal. Uh, that is to say, liberal remains a noun. That's very important. The core values of individual liberty remain at the heart of my thinking. But I think there's a lot of truth to be found in conservatism when it comes actually to human nature, uh, to culture and society, to the need for community and identity. And dare I say it, I think there's some truth is to be found in socialism, certainly in the social democratic tradition, when it comes to those aspects of solidarity and equality. So I think, yes, a socialist conservative liberal, um, but also a liberal who is constantly learning, constantly trying to self-correct. I, you know, my formula is that we need to be self-critical fighters. A hard psychological stance to maintain, but I believe absolutely the correct one. Uh, and a good antidote to Robert Frost's famous definition of a liberal as someone who cannot take his own side in an argument. Exactly. With that, Jeff, it's 1130. Uh, and I toss it back to you uh, to adjourn the meeting. So Bill, thank you very much. So to Bill for uh, on travel today for being available and doing such a, a wonderful, eloquent job of managing and leading the conversation. To all of you, you're busy and some of you are in different time zones and you have a lot on your plate. Thank you for your kindness and the generosity of spirit and time. To Timothy Gartnash, Professor Gartnash, thank you. This was rich and from our perspective, my perspective, extremely helpful. I'm going to read your essay for a third time this weekend. Timothy, if I may, I think it's only appropriate in uh, conclusion. Do you have a final thought, proposal, provocation? Let's give you the final word. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed this hugely. And of course, um, um, this is the, the question we are all wrestling with. I don't really have a grand final thought, but I have a more modest one, which connects to your own work and your own life indeed, Jeff, and to that of many others on this, on this call, which is, I really do worry about a kind of continental drift between the American discussion of this subject and the discussion in Europe or other parts of the world, you know, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, even the early 2000s, it was one conversation. It was one, we were one community of people. And now there seems to be such a specific set of challenges in the United States. And the American conversation is so very centered, understandably, on the problems in the United States. But also the European conversation is... Uh, is drifting off in its own particular directions. So I guess my appeal to you is maybe to connect the American Purpose to your sister organization, which doesn't yet exist, European Purpose. <laughs> so, so with that, um, our gratitude to everybody who is with us. If your camera is off and you're inclined or able to do so, feel very, very free right now just to switch it on 
for a moment to say hi and bye. Everybody stay safe. And to thank Professor Timothy Garden Ash, Bill Galston, all of you. Great conversation. Thank you Great so much. Pleasure. Great pleasure. Thank you so much.